Okay, friends, this is uh, what we were looking at the last session um, before morning tea. We said we had a double problem. Um, our sin, our disobedience is condemned by God. And we praise God that in the Lord Jesus, the penalty for all of that is removed and we're brought to a state of innocence, like Adam in the garden, I suppose. But it's better than that, because all that Christ has done, all the obedience he offered to his Father, all the love and the faith that came from Christ, is imputed, credited, reckoned to our account. So we're better than innocent, we're fully righteous. All the, all the works of the law, complete and finished in us. It's a story of really the most amazing grace, isn't it? Um, it's almost unbelievable that it could be so good. Um, but it is true. It is to be believed. And uh, it, this, this is where I think, friends, we're supposed to, God wants us to uh, swim. You can, you can paddle, you can wade, or you can swim. But boy, you need deep water to swim. And these are great things. This is a great place to swim. And it's exactly where the Lord takes us. Well, if I can summarise some of the things we've been looking at in the letter to the Romans. We'll come to Galatians in a tick. But first of all, back to Romans. We saw first session yesterday that the guilt we bear for sin has been paid for by Jesus and the wrath of God, his Father, has been satisfied. That's Romans 3. We didn't look at Romans 4, but Romans 4 is the story of faith. Abraham who comes with empty hands and he receives. He doesn't bring. Faith receives, not gives. And, and uh, Abraham, with his empty hands, receives. And uh, the knowledge of salvation in Jesus comes to the empty-handed, those who rest on Jesus. And Romans 5, we saw before morning tea today, that all the obedience that the law requires of thee, uh, Jesus has made. And it's all credited to all who are in him. Now think about it for a moment. If there are no sins left to condemn, and if every requirement of the law has been fulfilled, what's the obvious question? Sin's gone? All the requirements of the law completed. What's the obvious question? Is it only obvious to me? <laughs> well, I think the obvious question is, well, then, does it matter how I live? If all my sins are forgiven and my, my account is full, then what I do is really quite irrelevant. And I think it's such an obvious question that when Paul has worked through those chapters, 3, 4 and 5, of Romans, he comes to chapter 6, what for us is chapter 6, and he says in verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Or verse 15, are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? That's the obvious question. Does it matter then how I live? And the theme for this uh, last session, friends, is that if you're justified... Uh, justification shows. It shows in the way that you live. My standing is not impacted by how I live. Not at all. My status is secure. But that status shows in practice. And that's what we're talking about this morning in this last session. Uh, Jesus died to, well, perhaps you use the terms yourself, he died to kill the penalty of sin and he lived to fulfil the requirements of the law, but he also died to change the practice of sin. Penalty dealt with, practice, that's part of the deal. Imagine Jesus saying, look, your sins are so bad, it took me to die for them to be removed. But don't worry, keep doing them, it doesn't matter. That would be, that would be a, a, a foolishness. John Piper puts it like this. He says, because Jesus has cancelled sin, he calls on us also to conquer sin. Or another phrase he used in the same um, paragraph almost was, 
the sin-bearing work of Jesus results in sin-killing work for us. The sin-bearing work of Jesus leads to sin-killing work in us. Now, I can't think of a, a, a single letter in the New Testament that doesn't connect those two things. Christ has dealt with sin and answered the claims of the law. Therefore, live like this. There's a consequence from being justified. And uh, one, one reference will do. Um, I think I wrote down six or eight originally, but there's too many. So just, just one uh, in the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 11. Sorry, chapter 2, verse 11. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Now, you know that doesn't mean every single person, don't you? He's just gone through all the different groups of, of people that are in the church, the young, the old, the women, the men, the da 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 for all kinds of people. So the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all kinds of people. What does it do? It educates us. It sends us to school. Training us, is the translation here, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. To live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. You get the connection? Certainly Christ has come to, to um, bring salvation. That salvation results in, the way that, results in changes in the way that we live. Justified people live differently from the way that they lived before. So what we want to talk about now is the connection between being justified and the way that you live. Now, the word the, word the Bible uses for um, living in a different way, in a separate way, in a, in a holy way, is the word sanctification. Now, we've had some big words this weekend, propitiation, and we've had redemption and a few others. Now we've got justification and sanctification. Justification means I'm, my standing before God is safe and secure. Sins removed, obedience credited. I'm safe. Justification, I'm declared not guilty, but obedient in every respect. Sanctification is the word that describes the change that go on in me as a, as a believer, as someone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you this, folks, and I'll say it, I'll say it twice in case you miss it the first time. We must never divorce sanctification from justi or justification from sanctification but we must never confuse them. <laughs> Say it again. We must never divorce or separate sanctification from justification, but we also must never confuse them. They're different. Let me try and explain what I mean. And I think, uh, I think uh, Cal Calvin says, um, Christ justifies no one whom he does not at the same time sanctify. It's inevitable that, you go, that the two go together that the change that comes with justification, the change in who you are, the way you live, is so, is so closely tied to being justified that you've got to say, if you're not pursuing holiness, if you're not seeking to be holy, I'm not saying be, being perfect, if you're not seeking to be holy, you've really got to wonder, well, am I really justified? Because they're so, they are so closely tied together. But while they're inseparable, and certainly those whom God has joined together, let no man separate... Though they're joined together, uh, they're not the same. Let me, uh, let me see how we go here. There's a big difference between the two, and I think you've got this in your handout today. And let me just... This, I'm not, I've got no verses put up against these, though I can give them to you, but this is a summary. I want to just show the difference. My justification is God's action alone. I do nothing. Not 10%, not 8%, not 1% to contribute to my justification. It's all God's work. The word we use is monogistic, if you've ever come across that word. My sanctification, my being made holy, on the other, on the other hand, is that I'm involved. So God doesn't, God doesn't say, well, I'll believe for you, or I'll love people for you, 
or I'll speak the truth for you. No, he says, you speak the truth. You love. You believe. I'm involved. Not so with justification. Big difference. My standing in heaven is changed in justification. Sanctification is a change in my character on earth, which one day will be perfect when I see Jesus, but he will always be imperfect because, go in the next line down under sanctification, because sanctification is progressive. It's always imperfect, always incomplete in this life. Justification, on the other hand, is instantaneous. God says, justified, not guilty, and it's complete. No one can come to court and say, but hang on, you don't really know the truth about John. No, he says, finished. The sentence has been given, not guilty. The verdict has been given, sorry, not guilty. There is no sentence to be, to be in, uh, imposed. Justification removes the guilt of sin. Sanctification, we're talking about a change in the practice of sin. Justification is the root of right, righteousness. Sanctification is the fruit of righteousness. Now, they're quite different. If you confuse one with the other and your life goes through a pretty rough patch and you say, but it's on the basis of what I'm like that I'm, I'm uh, justified, you're sunk. No, no, the basis on which I'm justified is the standing in heaven that Christ has secured for me. That's my justification. My sanctification, imperfect, progressive, changes from bit to bit, day to day, month to month, year to year. Uh, that's a sign... That's an evidence, that's a fruit of my justification, but it's not the basis of my justification. The root of my justification is in Jesus. Now, I don't know whether that helps you, but if you can, I want to plead with you that you can't separate the two, but nor must you confuse them. They mean different things, but they always go together. That's really important. And so when the Bible talks, when the New Testament letters talk about being redeemed for good works, your good works never become the basis for your justification or the lack of them never become the basis for your condemnation. It's not like that. But they do follow uh, the work of being justified. And uh, how does it show? Well, let me give you a few, a few instances. There are, there are hundreds we could give, but let me just uh, mention three that come from the passage in Galatians and uh, one from Romans First of all, if you just go back to Romans 3 for a moment, please. We will come to Galatians, I promise. Well, unless Christ comes first, but apart from that, we'll go back there. Oh, unless I drop dead, that's another reason we might not get there. But um, just back to Romans 3 for a tick. If you look at chapter 3, verse 26, I don't know whether you've realised, but we've gradually been working through these verses and we've sort of kept basically covering them all by the time we get to the end. Verse 26. God showed his righteousness because in his divine forbearance... Sorry, let me just go back. That's not the verse I want. I want to go back to verse... Um, Yeah, verse 26, it is 26, what am I saying? It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, and then you read the next verse, which we haven't read. Okay, if that's so, then what becomes of our boasting? Verse 27, it is excluded. It's not on. Now, what did, you do, what did you do to put yourself in the right with God? Were you seeking God? No, we saw in chapter 3, verse 11, no one seeks for God. And it's wrong to talk about people who are seeking God. We don't seek God. We hide from God. We run from God. We don't run to him until God puts the desire in us, but it's not natural to us that people seek God. No, no one seeks for God, not even one. 
Did you respect or honour God? Verse 18 of chapter 3 says, No, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Did you do a bunch of right things? That means God should, should have been treated you with, a, with a, bit, a bit of a kinder way. No, verse 20 says, By works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Or was it your faith that made you right with God? Verse 22 says, No, it was the faith of Jesus that made us right with God. We think there are big differences between gross sinners and respectable sinners. We'll all nod. Yeah, we know we're sinners, but we're respectable sinners. We're not really like the bad kind of sinners. And there are differences between sins. There's no question about that. But once you bring God into the picture, you can't talk about respectable sinners and gross sinners. That the guy who's standing at the bottom of a coal mine can reach up, and the guy standing at the top of Mount Everest can reach up, but neither of them reach the stars. It's all a bit, the difference is a bit irrelevant when you start talking about big things, great things, supernatural things. No, we're pretty much on the same level. The differences are pretty marginal between us. Well then, if that's the case, when you tell people about Jesus, how superior do you think you can be? I'm better than you. <laughs> How superior do you think you can be when you talk to people about the Lord Jesus? Let me take that off. Sorry. As one man says, no, it's not I'm better than you, but it's more like I'm a beggar who found bread and you're a beggar too. I can tell you where you can find bread. <laughs> It doesn't come from a position of superiority that we speak about the Lord Jesus. We sang that uh, lovely song yesterday, um, Judge of the Secrets of the Hearts of Men. I know in my heart I'm just like them all. That's what we sang yesterday. I'm just like the rest and no better. But I'm justified. Yeah, but I'm no better in myself. But you've got a new righteousness. Yep, I have. But I'm no better in myself than the next person. We're all on the same level when it comes to that. So if I said to you, what did you you bring to the table of God's righteousness? What did you bring? You brought what everybody else has brought. Your sin. End of story. You haven't brought anything to commend you. Uh, It's not like that. You are what you are by the grace of God. Not because you're any different from anybody else. It's all because you've been loved and chosen and called and justified. If that's the case, then what becomes of our boasting, our bragging, our superiority? If you brought nothing to the table, friend, you haven't got a single leg to stand on when it comes to feeling better than anybody else. Nobody at work, nobody in your family. Think of the worst person in your extended family. Some of us got pretty rocky sort of histories across our families. Think of the worst ones. You're no better. You might be uh, reaching for the stars from Mount Everest, and he's reaching for the stars from the coal mine. (laughs) But... um, No one's getting close. Uh, You know better. There's no room for boasting. If I said to you, what have you added to the perfect life of Jesus? We said this morning, you can't add anything. And friends, I don't know anything that reduces a big head or a take notice of me sort of disposition. Look at me, look at me like the doctrine of justification does. People want to say, all this stuff about being justified, what, what practical relevance has it got? Everything. It changes the way you think about yourself. It changes the way you come across to other people. I tell you, big names, I don't count. Titles, who cares? Big claims, big fame, They all lie in the dust 
at the foot of Jesus. They're worthless when it comes to the things that really matter. Well, how do you go on that on the humility state? It's like to talk about yourself, make your views known, want to be noticed, want to brag. Look what I did for Jesus. Friends, if you get the doctrine of justification, it all goes. A new humility comes in its place. There's a new certainty when you get the doctrine of justification through. If I said to you, where does, where does faith fit into all the things that we've been saying? We've touched on this. We know that faith is credited to all who believe. The faith of Jesus is credited to all who believe. It's by faith and by faith alone that we take hold of the faithfulness of Jesus. And while that's true, some of us want to put our faith in our faith. That's deadly. Because tomorrow it won't be what you want it to be. And then you're sunk. No, you, faith is, I said yesterday, empty hands. It says, okay, it's to Jesus I cling. And it's on him. I, in him I place my confidence. My confidence is not in my believing. My confidence is in Jesus believing. Big difference. Now, some of us here are the introspective types. Um, not too many left, but there are some around. Who they sort of run a gloriometer over themselves each morning to see how their sin's tracking and how their faith's feeling and uh, you know, what's going on inside. And, you know, oh, and uh, they're overcome by um, their weak love for the Lord Jesus and the fact that their faith is mixed with doubts. And uh, I tell you, when it's like that, your confidence is shot. Hard, hard to even pray. When all you can think is, all I am, all I am, is a sinner who's falling short, falling short, always falling short, falling short, every day falling short, falling short. And some of us like to be there. It's almost like we're masochists. And we drag our feet and we don't smile much. I tell you, we're not much fun to be with, to be quite honest. Of course you're falling short. That's what we found in Romans chapter 3. All are falling short of the glory of God. Of course you are. But some of us are the less um, introspective types. And we just charge on without asking too many questions. Uh, we don't think about much about falling short. We think we're doing pretty, pretty well, thank you very much. Um, we can point to all the things that we're accomplishing. And after all, we've got lots of friends who tell us how wonderful we are and how nice we are and how, what, what great, terrific Christians we must be. So, yeah, we feel pretty good about ourselves. Now, if you're the introspective type... As I say, you're not as easy to be with as the person who just charges on positively. And if you're somewhere in between, and we all are, I suppose, one end or the other or somewhere in between, uh, the, problem, the real problem for this guy is the same as the problem for this one. Neither of them is looking at Jesus. This person's looking at his sins. This person's looking at his achievements. They're both deadly. Absolutely deadly, because they take your eyes away from the Lord Jesus. I spoke yesterday about um, the fact that we, we live in a, in a, a time now, and, and Christians are a part of it, where we're very man-centred and feeling-centred. Um, what do I feel is true? What fits with my lived experience? What resonates with me? And so we go on. And uh, if it fits, then okay, I'll believe it. But it's ultimately about me and how I feel about what's going on. And uh, we measure our progress, we measure our where we're at on, on based on the progress that we make as a Christian or the estimation that other people have of us. And uh, if something goes wrong along the way, and as it inevitably does in life, uh, well, we just 
if we feel this is too rocky and it's too hard and has God done, has God said, is God doing? And so it goes on. If you're basing it on how you feel, um, it's a bad way to be. And the person who's up the other end, who feels pretty good about himself and people pat him on the back all the all time, the day's going to come when the person who patted him, patted him on the back the most gives him the flick. Might be your wife. Might be your husband. Might be a good friend. What then? Of your confidence. Of your assurance. It's gone. And you'll crash. One way or another. Anybody along there who's looking at anything along here, instead of looking at Jesus, his death and his life, his propitiation and his righteousness, if you're looking anywhere else, you're sunk. Now, this is really Christianity 101, I think. But I'm not sure most Christians are here, or many Christians are here. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones was um, one of the most influential preachers in England in the 20th century, if not the most influential, perhaps. Uh, He didn't think he was. He thought he was really a nobody. And he said once, you know, if I, if I knew that I was preaching, I wouldn't even cross the road to hear me preach. Uh, he, was a, he was very, very, had a good sense of his own capacity. He had that kind of humility. He wasn't boasting. And after he died, um, his daughter was asked, what was the key to his long ministry in London? And it was a ministry of some 30 years uh, quite an impressive ministry. And she said, I don't think he ever got over his salvation. He never stopped being surprised by it. He never got over the fact that he actually was saved by Jesus. He didn't look at what was going on in his day-to-day gloriometer scale. He didn't rely too much on the estimation of his friends. Because he had a view of Jesus that dominated, in the end he could say, I don't care what they think. In the end, my sins aren't going to condemn me. I'll move on in humility and in confidence. I hope you don't think that you've gotten past Jesus. That's a trap. Some of us here have been Christians 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. The danger is to think, okay, I'm now past all that. That's sort of ABC stuff. That's kindergarten stuff. I really don't know why we spent a whole weekend on it, really. We're we're all past that. Friends, you're never past it. It's the big story. And if the big story isn't the big story for you, uh, you'll never be able to be the sort of person that God wants you to be. You never outgrow these things. You never get past them. It's not a case of, okay, well, we've sung all those songs about the up would I look and see him there and uh, man of sorrows and all. Yeah, but look, let's, let's get on to something a bit more trendy and with it. You'll never be able to live the kind of changed life you want to be if that's you. And I don't think, you could, with good reason, you can put your head on your pillow tonight in confidence that everything's okay. If you're still worried about how I'm doing, good me, or how I'm doing poor me. And let me say, I think one's as bad as the other, if I may suggest that. If you're living off the back of people's estimation of you, you'll never be able to be the sort of person God wants you to be. You'll never take godly risks. You'll never enjoy Jesus the way that God means you to enjoy him. Well, a new humility, a new certainty, lastly, a new practical holiness now. Now, back in Galatians for the home stretch. When you read the letter to Galatians, it seems as though the people to whom Paul wrote this letter in the first place uh, had been here on the doctrine of justification, that Jesus somehow, by his grace, had put them on the team, but they were now saying, but to keep, to stay on the team, we've got to keep performing better than we have been. And so he says in chapter 3, verse 3, 
um, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh, by the things that you do? You got on the team by Jesus, but now you think you keep yourself on the team based on what you do. No, it's not like that. So that's why I think he says just a few, three verses ahead of that, back in chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, this is his slogan, I think, for life. I've been crucified with Christ. When he died, he was my head, I died. And all the claims of the law against me died. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live, here's the phrase again, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live off his life that justifies me the one who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The faithfulness of Jesus in his life and his death puts you on the team. And the faithfulness of Jesus in his life and his death keeps you on the team. And you live off that. And if people approve or disapprove, it's irrelevant If your sins are small or your sins are great, it's irrelevant. You live by the faithfulness of the Son of God, whose death was complete and whose obedience was complete. It's just the greatest story. And that's liberating in so many ways. And it's interesting when you read the letter to the Galatians, as Paul spells out how important this is, and he he then applies it to how it works out in life, just about everything he says in in the last two chapters of Galatians Refer to our relationships. I've been talking so much this weekend about the fact that we stand forgiven and God says not guilty. That's very personal and it's wonderful. But it's not how justification shows alone. And so chapters 5 and 6 of Galatians are all about how it shows in relationships with people. And if you're a justified person, it will show in the way that you relate. It will show in the way that you care for others. It will show in the way that you take on obligations to other people. Justified people don't live to themselves and say, well, what a, I'm in pretty good position here, that end of the story. No, it's not. It shows in all sorts of practical ways. And so you look at chapter 5, if you just turn over another page to chapter 5 of Galatians and verse 13. I'll just pick a couple of examples. You are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity just to please yourself, to look after yourself, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. What 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 has loving other people got to do with being justified? Well, everything. And for starters, Paul's talking about a church. And who are these other people in the church with whom I share my life? They're justified people. They're people who've been loved, predestined, called, justified. They really matter to the living God. I can't treat them lightly, for goodness sake. Just when it pleases me, I do what I like. You can't ignore or write off people like that. But what if, I, what if you try and love other people and it doesn't work? What if you try and, ser- what if you try and serve them? A couple of cases, like if you turn over to chapter 6, verse 1, here's a case of how loving somebody else works. If someone is caught in a transgression, you've been trapped by some sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now, here's a brother who is in a fix. Now, if I love him, I don't just leave him there. If he's doing something wrong and there's a pattern in his life that really is sort of gross, I don't leave him there. Justified people say, well, he's a justified person, he matters. And God justified him that he might also bring him to righteousness, righteousness of life. I, I can't just let the guy go. But what if, what if I talk to him and he accuses me of being self-righteous because I've sort of spoken to him about something I observed? What if, he, what if he says to me, but who do you think you are? What if I try to say something to him and it doesn't work and it backfires? What if he badmouthed me to somebody else? Friends, none of that matters if you're justified. 
if God says, I already approve of you, and no matter what bad names he might give you and the bad reputations that get around about you, you've got a great reputation with me. Go for it. And it frees you. That's the liberty he speaks of, to serve other people, regardless of the consequence, regardless of the risk. And you can take risks. I, I Personally, I think only either you're, uh, uh, you're thick in the head or you're justified. That's the only reason you can take risks in this life. But he says, take the risk. Go to the guy. Help him. Love him. Do good to him. And then if you go one more, just to, to um, the same chapter, chapter 6, verse 10, it's the same for everybody. So I've speaking, spoken about the justified people, the brother. So verse 10, as we have opportunity, let's do good to everyone, especially to those who have the household of faith. But there's to be a general um, care that you show to other people around you. What, what's justification got to do with doing good things to people, seeking the welfare of people? Seeking to bless people by the things you say and by the things you do. Well, everything. Because you're not doing it to score points. You can love the person for his sake. Remember, I said yesterday, the JW ladies who came, they, who came to our front door, they weren't really there to, because they loved me. It was, might have been mixed, I said, but at least part of it was that they were doing it to score more points. They were insecure before God. And so they had to do more to get more credit points to be safe. Well, if you don't have to do more because it's all done, there are no credit points to be had. And therefore you can serve other people because it's good to do, regardless of what comes back to you. You can love people from the heart and not because you love yourself from the heart. Justified people don't need results. Justified people don't need approval. Can I say that? Look, we live in a world where everything is governed by one of the results. You know, I go to pastors' conferences and people say, well, you know, how many people have been converted in your church during the last year? And if you say, well, I only know, of, I'm not sure I know of anybody. Oh, in our church we had 10 or we had 20 or we had, and in our church we've got this program and that program. And, and people start to sort of play off it. You can see it happening. And uh, the result thing is so big in people's mind. And the approval. I mean, uh, the, maybe I, I'm sure most people here wouldn't care if I approved of them or not. But there'll be someone in your life whose approval you want. And if you want it too much, it'll sink you. It really will. You'll never be able to speak the truth to that person and take risks to do so. Because maybe they'll be put off. Justified people don't need to be approved because they're already approved. You can afford to take the risk. You can afford to do what's godly. But of course we failed, haven't we? We've all failed. We failed in our churches. We failed in our families. We failed with our friends. We've mucked up our best efforts of doing anything. <laughs> I remember when John Piper finished... Um, up as pastor at Bethlehem Church in Minneapolis and uh, after nearly 30 years of quite fruitful ministry, wonderful ministry. And the guy, he was interviewed by a guy and the guy said to him, you got any regrets? He said, regrets? I've got millions of them. <laughs> he said, as I look back over those years, he said, so many meetings I mucked up, so many conversations that I didn't handle well. So many he said, I've never preached a good sermon yet. Meaning, a perfect sermon. No, no, none of us have made it. None of us. We've never done a very, none of us have done a very good job of getting over ourselves. Really. Some of us are a bit better than others, but basically it's pretty poor. None of us have done all that well at being self-forgetful in the cause of Jesus. Not really. A, a bit, but not like it ought to be. But because of the justifying life and death of Jesus, failure doesn't kill us. We get up and we go without being held by the past. A young man, um, Philip Melanchthon, a couple of us were talking about him yesterday, he was worried about sin uh, that was still in his life as a Christian. And he shared his concern with Martin Luther, 
who was an older friend. And this is what Luther wrote to him after he expressed, Philip expressed his concern. He said, God does not save those who are only imaginary sinners. Be a sinner. And let your sins be bold. But let your trust in Christ be bolder. No sin can separate us from him. Even if we were to kill or commit adultery thousands of times each day. Luther's too much of a Bible man to mean that sin doesn't matter. But he is saying that because justification is real, you can be honest about your sins. You don't have to pretend. I mean, for goodness sake, do you think the Lord knows what they're like? Do you think he knows the full extent of them? In a way that they, you even hide them from the people closest to you and to yourself? Yeah, you can be bold. Admit them. Get them out there. Because of justification, you're still safe. Melanchthon's sins were certainly bigger than I'm sure he even thought. And he ought to turn from them. But they change nothing. They change nothing. If his sins are this big, the justifying work of Jesus is bigger. Well, you humility, that's what justifying pe justified people have. Where's our boast? Not on. A new certainty, I'm confident, because I can't add to perfection and a new holy life. So where have we been this weekend? Well, we started with always falling short under the wrath of God, Jesus as a propitiation, guilt satisfied. In the second session, we saw that God, what Jesus wins, God loves to apply so that we enjoy and receive by faith with empty hands what he's done in Jesus. First session this morning, not just a record of innocence, but a record of righteousness. Every law kept, every obligation fulfilled. And now Jesus has redeemed us from all lawlessness to purify for himself, says the text, a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Brethren, I do hope you'll contend for these things. They are critical. They are enriching. I hope you enjoy them. I hope you swim in them and not just paddle. So over to you.